Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, go where you are treated best is the advice that Andrew Henderson shares with his high net worth clients. Nomad Capitalist seeks to help individuals that are subject to high taxes, even when they are operating their business from overseas. So what solutions can Nomad Capitalist offer? Well, Andrew joins us now to tell us more. But Andrew, start by talking to us about the concept behind Nomad Capitalist. Well, the five magic words are go where you're treated best. My father told me that almost 30 years ago. It's guided my life. You want to live in a place. You want to do business in a place. You want to bank in a place. You want to date in a place where you are not just tolerated, but you're celebrated. Find the best place. And what I think the people can do is they can diversify each part of their life to find what's the best place. And so you can live in Ireland, you can do business in Ireland, but perhaps you think that it's safer to store your money in Singapore. Well, those are some of the safest banks in the world. You could get yourself an account there. Doesn't mean you're going to save on tax, but it means that you have access to the best banks. And you can do that with all the different parts of your of your personal and business life. And Andrew, where are you treated best? I'm really focused on the concept that I'm calling levers. I mean, I, I love Ireland. I think, you know, some of the nicest people to, to spend time with, and I'm, I'm proud to uh, spend some time here and to contribute. We have people who work for us here. We pay some tax here. I think for me, as someone who comes from an English-speaking place, to after many years of exploring far-flung corners of the world, it's a nice place to have to spend some time. I think, you know, for me, what I've learned around the world, and I think people in Ireland would appreciate, is you want to optimize for kindness and, and people who are nice. And I, again, I think Malaysia is a phenomenal example. We produce content all around the world. I don't think we've ever had a crossword from a Malaysian. You know, we were just in Colombia. We got a great welcome. And we got a couple hundred people who, who complained that we're showing the luxury parts of their city. We've never had that in Malaysia. So I think that, you know, kindness is important. And what's interesting is a place like Malaysia, I loved it before I knew what the tax policy was, before I knew what the immigration policy was. It's an open society. I think among English-speaking countries, Ireland really stands out for that reason. If you want to start a business, this is a country you can come to that's through that, unlike the U.K., unlike the U.S. for many people, unlike Australia, uh, they want entrepreneurs. So that's a good thing. But if you're living here, you know, I think Malaysia is one that really has stood out to me. Are your clients operating in particular sectors and would they be considered high net worth individuals? We work with high net worth individuals. You need about half a million US dollars a year or you need a million dollars liquid to work with us. That's who we work with. And we see waves. I mean, we see people who are cryptocurrency and Bitcoin investors. We see e-commerce. We see increasingly, though, people who have had money for a lot longer. So we're seeing older and older money. Obviously, our company's growing. But I think that shows that people, especially in the U.S., U.K., Australia, Germany, who maybe didn't think about leaving five years ago, are now thinking about it. I had a friend of mine from Canada. I thought this guy was never going to leave. He emailed me last week. I need to get a second passport. Uh, I'm afraid of anti-Semitism. I'm afraid of the government. So we work with those folks. It's getting more intense. So how can a business ethically and legally reduce their taxes by operating a business overseas? Well, the big thing is, I mean, generally speaking, uh, you need to go with it. I mean, we're not talking about Starbucks or Facebook here. We're talking about, you know, I run a business with 82 people. If I'm running the business, if I'm calling the shots, I generally need to go. So the idea of I'm going to stay in, the, in Ireland, I'm going to stay in the U.S., I'm going to stay in Australia, put my company in a tax haven, and that solves my problems, that's not how it works. Um, we have people who do that just because they want you know, asset protection or they want to hire overseas, but you're not going to lower your taxes without leaving your country. And you need to generally move a lot of the staff. Now, we have folks in Ireland and, and there's ways that you can legally, you know, have different companies for staff around the world if you have people here and you want to keep them. But I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of people who say, hey, I, I have 20 people working for me. A lot of them want to go to Mexico or Malaysia or Thailand or Uruguay or Dubai with me. So it's about where the work is done, not necessarily where the customers are, but where you are and where your team is. Uh, That's why, for example, I mean, the U.S. is one of the most stringent. We don't hire people who live in the United States. Uh, We can't do that. As to ethically, you know, I don't take the extreme view of some libertarians where all taxation is theft. But, you know, I, I look at it this way. You would not tolerate in any aspect of your life other than this 
people giving you bad service and charging you a lot. If you took your clothes to the dry cleaner or if you went to a restaurant and the service wasn't up to par, you wouldn't pay for it. And you certainly wouldn't pay 40 or 50 cents on the euro. And so, you know, why is this the one area where it's bad to shop around? Due to historical events, going offshore can have a negative public perception. How would you respond to that? I don't know that if you run an e-commerce company, you have to worry about it. I get emails all the time where in the signature with the address, it's somewhere in Malta, it's somewhere in Cyprus, it's somewhere in the UAE. I think people are more open to that. It's a global world. We're doing business with companies around the world. We're buying more stuff online that isn't necessarily in our country. If you're from a smaller country like Ireland, you probably don't assume everybody's where you are. You know, do you lose somebody? I have had clients mention that, but that was more seven, eight, nine years ago. Hey, I wouldn't want people to think I renounced my U.S. citizenship, whatever. I think that there's a lot more openness about that now. You know, our, our, our procedure here is radical transparency. You know, I don't know that it has to be announced for every company. I mean, if you're just an online company, that's fine. I don't think even if you moved part of your physical company overseas, you have to announce it. But I've seen a shift. I think more people understand it, uh, especially if you're selling to, you know, higher level people who are in business themselves. And from a practical level, what do business owners need to be aware of when operating a business overseas? What, you want to understand what the audit requirements are, uh, what the regulations are, uh, what you have to file, what you have to keep track of. I mean, I'll tell you, looking at Ireland and the tax returns that we've lodged, um, you know, it's relatively straightforward compared to other countries in, in Europe. Um, but if you go to some of these, you know, tax-friendly jurisdictions, they're going to have a higher standard. So we have an in-house finance team. You could potentially just hire an auditor to take care of that for you or have someone out, you know, outside. But you want to understand what those regulations are. One of the things that, that frustrated me in Dubai is it's not built for running remotely. So theoretically, you could say, I'm going to live in Malaysia, but my company is going to be in Hong Kong or previously in Dubai before this new tax, where why would you pay 9% to not live there? Pay 9% to live there if you want. But you know, Dubai and the UAE was not a place that was really set up for uh, remote access. It was designed for you live here. So that's the kind of thing that people think, oh, the UAE is perfect. I'll just travel the world with my UAE company. Uh, it's not that simple. And I think people also want to consider where they're spending time. What is your tax residence? I look at the, what I call the tax-friendly quadrant. There's you, where you're leaving, where you're arriving as a person. Where's your company leaving? Where's your company arriving? You've got to plug in all those four holes and you've got to understand that some places do have more paperwork. In terms of the stage of the career that entrepreneurs are at when they contact you, is it a few years prior to the sale of a business? Well, that's an important thing, whether you're selling a business or whether you're selling your Bitcoin. We had a, a gentleman hire us once three different times and he hired us the third time once the paperwork was signed to sell the business. I think we found some way to save him a little bit of money, much more than he paid us, but very small in comparison to if he had hired us the first time, because as the value of your assets increases, now Ireland's system is a bit more easygoing than some. But you know, generally speaking, when you leave a country, you could be subject to pay some kind of exit tax. You can't just make a bunch of money and then leave at the 11th hour. So uh, this is not to give anybody tax advice, but generally speaking, obviously the income you make, the sooner you leave, the, the more you save. But you don't want to wait till the 11th hour. How do you see this market adapting over the coming years? I think it's getting bigger. I mean, people talk about digital nomads and, you know, backpacking and working in co-working spaces. I mean, that's where it started many years ago. That was never my interest, but we're seeing some very, very sophisticated, I mean, people's names who you would know, very wealthy people saying, yeah, I get it. I need to be diversified. It's coming to the West. It used to be something that I think Easterners understood more than Westerners. So I think it's just getting bigger, quite frankly. And I think you're just seeing more people who are realizing, why am I paying so much and getting so little? And I think that probably a lot of countries around the world thought that, hey, the party will never end. But again, the places where I hire, the places where I live in Latin America, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, increasingly Central Asia, they're now becoming more competitive. And people are realizing, you know, there's more than one hotel in town. Let me not overpay. So I think that just merely growing. And what I'm also seeing is people saying, I don't just want a second passport. I want four second passports. They're coming in more with that mindset. Andrew, finally, on the basis of that, what are your future growth plans for Nomad Capitalist? Well, we're building, you know, people in countries all around the world. I mean, we have a great R&D team. 
We were constantly researching, you know, how do I get citizenship in Mozambique? Just because some people want these exotic options. So we're always researching new opportunities. We're putting more people on the ground around the world. And I think um, as much as North America in particular is a growth market, we want to be global because I think that um, customers uh, outside of the West are often, um, you know, great customers as well. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Andrew Henderson from Nomad Capitalist. And I'd like to thank Andrew for sharing his knowledge with us this morning. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.